Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we're gonna be talking about water and specifically distilled versus reverse osmosis, versus spring water, versus tap water, and which one is best for your plants, both indoors and outside. And we're gonna get into the science of this. So this isn't going to be, I think, or I feel, this is going to be hard facts as to which one is best for your plants and also for your soil because there is a slight difference between the two. So the best way to identify which type of water is best for your plants is to first identify the differences in chemical or structural makeup between all the different types and how they are made. So first up is distilled water. And I think this is the one I hear people watering with most commonly. And so distilled water is simply water that can be tap water or spring water that heat is applied to and the liquid is turned into a vapor and then back into a liquid again, ultimately leaving behind any heavy metals, microbes, anything that cannot be put into water vapor is simply left behind in the original distiller and the new water or the fresh water is on the other side. So it's very similar to what clouds are doing with oceans and lakes around us. So very similar concept and that is what distilled water is. There's no filters involved with distilled water. The other option is reverse osmosis water. So to Reverse osmosis is also considered deionized water. And so this involves no heating, but it does involve a series of different filters that are very, very fine. So it is on average expected that reverse osmosis water removes 90 something percent. It's like 99% of all minerals, viruses, bacteria, microbes from the water, leaving you behind relatively pure H2O. So distilled and reverse osmosis are very similar in a lot of ways. Keep in mind that reverse and distilled does not have any minerals in it. So it doesn't have calcium, magnesium, helpful minerals, but it also doesn't have harmful minerals such as lead or arsenic, for example. It's not uncommon for reverse osmosis in particular to be considered dead water. And it's actually to the point where the World Health Organization says right on their website that it is ill-advised to actually consume reverse osmosis water because of the lack of minerals in it. Water has a charge to it or a pH to it that makes it want to have dissolved minerals in it. So when we remove dissolved min minerals from the system, when it passes through a body system, a plant system, a soil system, it's going to try to grab as many dissolvable minerals as it possibly can to help neutralize or equalize its chemistry. So that's why we consider distilled or reverse osmosis unsafe to drink in large quantities or over extended periods of time. And we generally call it dead water because it doesn't have the much needed nutrients on a micro side that human bodies need. So because we're missing so many minerals that are typically positively charged, similar to what we see in the soil, calcium, for example, manganese, magnesium, zinc, boron, those are all positively charged mineral ions. And so when we are missing those positively charged ions, we end up with a water or a soil that is void and craving those positive charges. So as it passes through the soil system, if it's reintroduced to other water, the human body, plants, it's going to try to attract those towards it. If it doesn't have those minerals available to it, it is considered acidic on the pH range. So it starts dipping below that seven mark. So for some of us, this may be beneficial, especially if we have plants that need acidic water, but overall, generally speaking, water pH isn't going to make that big of a difference in a garden format. Uh, for sure, it will not make a difference. Your pH is more determined by your parent material. And then on the potting soil side, that dip into more acidic ranges isn't going to affect it too, too much because your potting soil in general is already relatively acidic because it's probably peat based or coconut coir based. So this brings us to our third option, which is spring water. And we see spring water all the time. And this spring water does have minerals in it. The reason why it has minerals in it is because spring water in Canada anyways, 
has to be taken from an underground spring and the least amount of manipulation can be done to it. So whatever is naturally present underground will be present in your bottle of water. The exception to this is that there may be some ozone in it and ozone is essentially an addition of an oxygen compound and the oxygen compound is more so for flavor, smell, taste, that sort of thing. There is also very low but some levels of fluoride and fluoride is a naturally occurring element and therefore what's in spring water is naturally occurring fluoride it's not added and that's especially true in canada fun fact when i was actually researching for this video did you know that the photo on the outside like the label on the outside of your spring water has to match the landscape of that has to match what's in the bottle so if you have spring water from saskatchewan and it's not showing you a prairie field that can actually be taken by uh, the food inspection agency in canada and you can get slapped with a major fine because it's considered false advertising so when you see a mountain range on the outside of a canadian package of water that's actually the mountain range that that spring water was taken from just total side note so because spring water does have the actual ions or the metals or minerals inside of it we have a more alkaline water and that's because we have more of the positively charged ions incorporated into the system now what's the difference between tap water and spring water and the truth here is not much because most lakes rivers and sources of tap water come from spring water sources so because of that um, there is some alterations that are done you know such as chloramine or chlorine being added and that's what makes it slightly different is the higher salts so tap water and spring water are similar there is added salts in tap water to help with the purification process there also is some added fluoride and they do that because of dental reasons they say so um, They've done studies and they show that if there's more fluoride in the water when you go to drink it, that people, populations that have that, have better teeth. I, I know there's a whole other side of that story, but I'm not gonna get into that today. So that leads us to our next question, which is, is chlorine harmful to plants? And the answer is not really. So they've done quite a few studies on both chlorine and chloramine to look at whether or not it affects plants. And one of the most popular studies done was using 100 parts per million on plants, parts per million of chlorine in the water on plants. And the results were that the plants were completely fine. There was another group that pushed it just a next step further and they did 150 parts per million in the water for I think 160. 50 or some days and they actually rested for two days and within two days all the soil microbiology throughout the entire soil profile had actually bounced back in less than two days it was back to its original populations so that does tell us that if we're continually watering with a chlorinated or chloramine water is that our micro populations will decrease over time because those salts do kill the microbes off however give it a little bit of a rest two days <laughs> and they'll bounce right back so for most of us in our case we are watering every day especially with house plants we're watering maybe once a month so we'll have a 24-hour period where we'll have lower microbial activity but within 24 hours we'll have full-blown microbial activity until the next time we decide to water with our tap water so say you have a plant that you know cannot take any sort of chlorine or chloramine how do you remove it well, the easy answer to this is if your city does use chlorine and you can do a quick Google on what your city does use, it actually is a very volatile product. And so it will gas off overnight. If you just leave your watering can out for 24 hours, your chlorine will be completely not present any longer. Now, the in Canada, I it's like 25% and most of that 25% is the major cities use chloramine, which is not chlorine. So I've seen this on platforms, I've seen this on Facebook group pages, where they're talking about just leave the cup out and the chloramine will gas off like the chlorine. And it's 
it's a drastically different compound. So while some will gas off, most of it will not. And this is when you insert carbon filter. So uh, if you use a carbon filter to actually pour the water through, such as a Brita filter, you can remove chloramine. So just to drive this point home, I did do some research on how much chloramine the Brita filters have removed and through independent studies, they have tested it to be 99.97% effective in removing all chloramine from your water, which is basically zero. So the only one that was like slightly better by a 10th of a percent was the one that goes on directly on the tap and not the one that goes in the fridge. So the one on the tap is like a 10th of a percent better than the actual container itself. So if you really want to make sure you don't have salts, you have specialty plants, or you're noticing chlorine toxicity, then this is the answer. So how do you identify chlorine toxicity? And it's very easy. It is just simply chlorosis. Now it's pretty unlikely that you were ever going to see this. It's going to take very, very high levels of chlorine for this to happen. But I will read off um, what one study found in regards to what this looked like. The process of chlorosis is simply just the yellowing of the leaves with bright green veins going through it. Now I would urge you to uh, think of maybe other reasons why you may have chlorosis such as overwatering, for example could be a reason for chlorosis and that's probably the more likely of the two so just keep that in mind but there you guys have it and a complete guide to water and watering plants so in conclusion the ultimate solution is actually technically spring watered or tap water that has been run through a Brita filter Reverse osmosis and distilled water will leach minerals from the soil and potentially from your plants because they are completely deionized, which is the opposite of what you want, especially when it comes to those lovely micronutrients that, you know, are not so easily replaced in the soil. So keep that in mind. Um, also, the pH of those two is less than ideal. We don't want acidic soil. We want to try to avoid that when possible. We want just slightly acidic, just, just below seven, not much, much more, or seven would be ultimately perfect. And I did a whole video on pH and uh, plants. So go check that out if you wanna learn more about pH and pH of your soil and nutrients and all that fun stuff. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, give this video a thumbs up, and let me know in the comments down below what you use to water your plants and what you've noticed when you've chosen that choice. I will talk to you guys next time, bye.